Um, Awesome. So the recording has been started. If uh, for any reason you do not want to be recorded, please feel free to leave your camera off and you can change your name. Um, so that's a little bit about uh, some background. Uh, I wrote in the chat, but please feel free to, uh, to let us know uh, where you're coming from, um, which kind of treaty land you're on, and also uh, your pronouns and maybe also why you're interested in being here. So um, I'm actually going to go to the next slide, John. Thank you. So this land acknowledgement uh, represents the land that we are currently on in Toronto or Toronto. Um, and we find a lot of times a lot of people have been doing these land acknowledgements, but sometimes it's more powerful to read through this. And I want to have a moment of silence for all the individuals, especially the women, the two spirit folks, and everyone impacted by colonization and in, in the Indigenous peoples of Canada. And we're incredibly gr grateful to have these opportunities. And again, I just want to offer a moment of silence. I encourage you all to learn about whose land you currently are on. And I'll pop a link in the chat for you to explore that. Go ahead. I'm going to pass it off to my colleague Annette, um, and she'll be introducing herself. And thank you so much for taking that moment of silence to reflect on the land and Canada's history of colonization. Thank you, Vina Malavir, for your heartfelt comments about the meanings behind the land acknowledgements that we hear so often. And it, like Vina, I encourage everybody to put your own land acknowledgements in the chat and to say hello. I'm Annette McKinnon, and I'm the moderator today. I'm a member of the Patient Partner Working Group of the Ontario Strategy for Patient-Oriented Research Support Unit, here, hereafter referred to as OSU. Welcome again to the webinar, and we'd like to start with some polling questions to get to know more about who's here and a couple other things. <clears throat> there are three questions, and they are all going to appear in the same window. Please scroll down the window so that you can answer the second question and the third one. And we're looking forward to the results. I hope that the responses are pouring in, John. They, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they are. So we have a large number of people registered today and we're really happy to see you all. And we'll just wait until we see the poll results before we continue. Ah, thanks everybody. Um, it's, a good, it's good to see that we have people from many areas of Canada. And I'm not sure if we have some from overseas or not because I haven't scrolled down the poll. Um, this is certainly a universal topic and it's welcome to see representation from both patient partners and from researchers um, in the audience and nicely <clears throat> varied levels of experience. Uh, next slide, please, John. We're here today to talk about sex, gender, and age in health research projects. As patient partners, we have a unique role, not the least of which is the ability to ask questions that aren't usually asked or thought of. Patient partnered research is gaining traction and the roles that patient partners play in the research cycle is expanding. This provides us with opportunities to have an impact on research and in today's case on sex, gender, and age considerations in health research. For example, you may have just joined a study team on the, at the idea generation stage or further along in the process. 
or you may be conducting your own research. You're either leading or co-leading or working as a citizen scientist. You may also be participating in a prioritization exercise or you're reviewing grants. And finally, you may be involved in translating research for your community. All of this engagement affords you the opportunity to advocate for health equity based on sex, gender, and age. At every stage of the research, we can have a voice. And today we're here to learn the basics of sex, gender, and age in health research and practical tips on how to advocate. So we'll begin our webinar with a presentation from Dr. Robin Mason on the basics of sex, gender, and age and how this impacts health research. Then we'll hear some firsthand experiences from patient partners and some practical tips and resources. And Robin will then tell us about the new module, which is a great resource for understanding sex, gender, and age. And we'll be sure to leave plenty of time for questions. We hope that by the end of the webinar, you'll have some tools for your advocacy toolbox, including questions to ask as your research project evolves through the entire cycle. And now I'd like to hand the mic to Dr. Robin Mason, who's a sex and gender-based analysis expert at the Women's College Hospital Women's Age Lab. Uh, thank you, Robin. Thank you, Annette. I'm just going to get myself organized here. Um, and I want to express my gratitude to the ASU patient partner group and the other patient partners who have worked so hard to put together today's presentation. Um, believe it or not, this has actually been months in the making. And when we had a meeting earlier in the week and I said I was a little bit sick, I had promised to be well by today. I'm working hard to uphold that commitment, um, but I may need to beg your indulgences as I stop, turn my mic off and cough erratically, or sip on my hot water and tea. I have been assured that most of you are similar, in similar states of either recovering from or becoming ill yourselves, so uh, we are sharing this experience together. <clears throat> So as Annette mentioned, as patient partners or as researchers, you have a critical role to play in bringing attention to these important concepts about sex, gender, and age. And I want to start out by saying these are not entirely simple ideas. We may have thought at some point that they were, but they aren't. Um, and many of the investigators who I work with themselves are still quite confused. If you read if you read journal articles, you may see that they're they're using the language of gender when what they really should be talking about are sex and sex differences. So today we're really going to try and get bring some clarity to this discussion. <clears throat> so I'm going to start with a series of true or false questions for you. And if you haven't been on your Zoom in a long time, you may have forgotten the chat uh, option down at the bottom of the screen. You can enter your answers in chat or you can just hold them in your head. So first true or false question, men and women, DNA is 98.5% identical. If you answered true to this question, then you're right. There is a high correlation of uh, DNA between men and women. Almost all our DNA is identical. Next question is, when it comes to checking themselves out in the mirror, men do it more times per day than women. Do you believe this to be true or false? Well, I'm going to tell you that a British study found that an average man looks in the mirror 23 times per day, while women do it only 16 times a day. And men average 10 minutes in total looking at themselves, which comes out to about six and a half days per year. So this is also true. Next question. Men tend to initiate breakups and divorce more often than women. 
If you thought this was true, you're not right this time, it's false. Research has shown that women initiated nearly 70% of all divorces and women express more dissatisfaction about the state of their marriage than do men. Men are more likely to say they're okay in a dissatisfaction, a dissatisfying relationship than women are. So some of these questions had to do with sex and some have to do with gender. And by the end of this session, I hope you'll be able to uh, describe which are which. So start with sex. We'll, we will define sex. It refers to the chromosomes, the gene expression, the hormone levels and function, as well as the reproductive anatomy of bodies. Although we generally think that sex describes males and females, and a lot of our demographic forms to this date have only allowed for male or female answers, we are increasingly aware of intersexed individuals. Intersex describes individuals whose genes, hormones, or sexual organs, quote, do not fit typical binary notions of male or female bodies. <clears throat> Intersex individuals occur with about the same frequency as those who are born with red hair, so it's not altogether uncommon. This yellow symbol in the middle is the chosen flag of the intersex community. And Intersex Awareness Day is October 26, so we've just passed it this year. Lupus. Let's consider some of the sex differences and the prevalence, course, and severity of common diseases and conditions such as lupus. Nine out of 10 individuals affected with lupus are women and they're commonly uh, affected between the ages of 15 and 44, so quite young. Multiple sclerosis affects two to three times more females than males. And in considering rheumatoid arthritis, 75% of those who are affected are female. So these autoimmune diseases occur in about 8% of the population, but of those who are affected, 80% are female. I'm now gonna show you um, just two slides with pictures. One of male drivers and the next of female drivers. I'll go back in a moment and let you take a look again at the male drivers and their positions in their cars compared to the female drivers and their positions. I've sometimes asked people to talk about or describe what they see as the differences, but we won't have time for that today. I'm gonna to have to actually just lead you through it. And what I'm going to highlight is the different physical stature and relationship of the female and male bodies to the steering wheel. This is important because airbags can move at 120 to 200 miles per hour and bring with them a force of nearly 2,000 pounds. Beginning in 2011, um, vehicles that year were required to use female petite crash test dummies uh, when they were testing frontal car crash tests. Up until that time, they hadn't used female crash test dummies and they found that short adult drivers, especially women, were being severely and fatally injured by the explosive force of the airbag, even in low and moderate speed crashes. And it's because of the closer proximity that women required in order to reach the steering wheel and the foot pedals. These sex differences are really important, especially when we're talking about medication or drug trials. And what we have come to see and what we are learning is that females process drugs differently than males, and that the menstrual cycle and hormones also impact the way medications and drugs are processed. Some of those examples are antihistamines, antibiotics, heart medications, and antidepressants. In drugs that have been withdrawn from the US market, 
eight out of 10 of them were withdrawn because they either had an adverse or no impact on females who were taking them, which is not surprising when we know that females also have twice the risk of developing an adverse reaction to a drug in comparison to males. So those are some of the important sex differences to be considering, but there are also gender issues to be thinking about. Many of the investigators with whom I have worked are themselves acute, um, confused about when to use sex and when to use gender when they're talking about uh, their research studies. Generally, when we're talking about gender, we are referring to the ways that as a society, we expect men and women to behave. Because gender is much more complicated, we tend to describe it by looking at the behaviors, the roles, the expressions, and identities of girls, women, boys, men, and gender diverse people. That is, those who do not always fit into the expected gender based on their sex at birth. <clears throat> A person who is born female and fits the gendered expectations of a woman is described as cisgender, and the same for someone born uh, male who lives as a man. We determine some of these things based on behaviors, roles, and expression. But gender is also made visible through internal and interpersonal relations that operate within our societies and our institutions. And because of that, our ideas of gender can change over time, culture, and place. Gender-related factors, including the roles, the relationships, the attitudes, the power imbalances, and identities we hold, affect individuals' experiences of and ability to access appropriate care. On nearly every continent and for all of recorded history, thriving cultures have recognized and revered and integrated more than two genders. So terms such as transgender and gay are new constructs that assume three things, that there are only two sexes, male and female, um, and as many as two sexualities, gay and straight, and only two genders. We increasingly recognize this as not so. The picture on the left of Franklin Delano Roosevelt from 1884 shows him wearing a white frock with a, a very fully plumed hat in his hand, little black patent leather shoes and white ankle socks. It's not what we expect, would expect of a young boy in our current age which is just to illustrate that gender is moderated by cultural values and that these can change over time and place. So um, um, among some of the work that I have done is to be looking at uh, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and other common health issues through a sex and gender lens. So diabetes is a disease in which the pancreas either fails entirely, produces too little insulin, or the insulin that is produced cannot be utilized. Insulin is required to help cells taking glucose and to be used for energy. So if we begin to look at sex and gender differences in the experience of diabetes, we can see as sex differences on the left-hand side of the screen that obesity is actually higher in females, but type two diabetes, which is often considered to be linked to uh, obesity is higher in males. In terms of age, males are diagnosed at a lower age and with a lower BMI than our females. And that type two diabetes risk increases with age. Men are less likely to disclose having type two diabetes to coworkers or friends than women are. And the role of women in the family often can interfere with their own self-management strategies. When we think about type one diabetes, which is different than type two diabetes, occurs at a younger age, and often uh, has to do with uh, failure 
of the um, uh, failure in production of glucose in the, in, to manage the insulin. Teen girls with type 1 diabetes report struggling more with stigma, self-image, and fitting in at school than boys with type 1 diabetes. I'm going to read something from the International Diabetes Federation, which declared women as the focus of World Diabetes Day in 2017. Gender roles and power dynamics influence vulnerability to diabetes, affect access to health services and health seeking behavior for women, and amplify the impact of diabetes on women. That's a quote. As a result of socioeconomic conditions, girls and women with diabetes experience barriers in accessing cost-effective diabetes prevention, detection, diagnosis, treatment, and care, particularly in resource-challenged countries. Socioeconomic inequalities expose women to the main risk factors of type 2 diabetes, such as di poor diet, nutrition, physical inactivity, tobacco consumption, and harmful use of alcohol. Here are two examples where neither sex nor gender alone would tell the whole story. In the example on the left, we are not provided any information about sex of the individuals, but if we look at ethnicity, there's tremendous variation in the prevalence of type two diabetes over time. Someone has their um, mic on, if you could mute yourself, unless you're asking a question and need to stop me. Thank you. Wouldn't it have been helpful here where the orange line represents Native Americans' experiences of diabetes? Wouldn't it have been helpful to know if there were differences here also by sex? In the Canadian example on the right, the investigators were looking for both sex and gender differences in risk and protective factors for type 2 diabetes and found that lower income and food insecurity affected men and women differently, increasing the risk of diabetes only for women. And further, that only women benefited from living in what they called an ethnically dense area, presumably because they learned from each other. If looking only at sex or only at gender, we would not have discovered the impacts of ethnicity, income, age, et cetera. So we have studies of fruit flies, mice, hamsters, frogs, monkeys, and men with this condition, but medical research using women as subjects just never occurred to anybody. Fortunately, that situation is changing. I think I'm now going to turn the screen back over to Annette and stop my share. Thank you so much, Robin. I'm sure that we've all gotten a lot of food for thought. Um, everybody keep putting your questions in the chat or saving them for the end. Um, and now what we're going to do is hear from some patient partners on how they've experienced sex and gender considerations in research and how it has changed their work. So I'll hand it over to Virtue Bajorni, who will introduce herself and share her experience with us. Oh. Hi, my name is Virtue Bajorni and I'm a patient partner with Diabetes Action Canada for about, I think, around five years. Um, I was diagnosed with type 1 almost 28 years ago. Um, and I worked on a handful of research pro projects as a patient partner with DAC. And um, sex and gender and, and age didn't always, actually, I don't remember it coming up on research projects before, but then I worked on a small qualitative study with Robin and um, some of her colleagues and some other patient partners from DAC. Um, and it was just striking how how different it was. And, and some of the things that came out of the research were uh, really highlighted, I think, the importance of including sex, gender, and age. Um, so, the research found considerable differences in experiences by gender, age, and race or ethnicity. 
Um, most who described experiencing diabetes stigma, discrimination, or microaggressions were women with diabetes marginalized by at least one other characteristic. But white men almost exclusively reported positive or neutral social and institutional experiences in the present. They said that they might have experienced diabetes stigma in the past, but um, that it had that in the present that wasn't the case. Um, racialized men reported discrimination due to race and ethnicity as well as immigration status, but they didn't report um, discrimination due to having diabetes. Um, then older men's perception of diabetes stigma was that it was improving over time, whereas uh, somewhat older women reported that they had experienced uh, decades of challenging and sexist treatment in their interpersonal and health encounters, and they didn't perceive that um, their experiences of stigma over time had gotten better. So I know for me, participating in this research project highlighted in like a very concrete and practical way why an intersectional lens that includes sex, gender, and age is very important. Um, and I think it's made me more likely to question or advocate for such an approach in future projects. Thanks, Annette. <laughs> okay, thanks for sharing this with us, Virtue. And now we'll hear from Vina, Vina Mohabir again. Thanks, Annette, and thanks, Virtue, for sharing uh, your beginnings in sex, gender, and age research. So my journey starts from a little bit of a different point. It actually started before I was engaged as a patient partner. I was diagnosed with chronic pain when I was a teenager and chronic pain primarily impacts one in five people in Canada. So that's you or somebody you know. Um, for me, that was me. So I was diagnosed with chronic pain as a teenager and chronic pain primarily impacts women. Now, when I began my chronic pain journey, I learned about managing pain and I learned about how to integrate kind of medical treatment with psychological and physical techniques in my pain management. However, there was a gap when it came to my pharmacological treatment. So those are things like my medications or injections. I noticed, and my doctors let me know that there was a gap, that this had not been tested, A, a kind of across the lifespan, and it had not been counted um, in individuals like me as a teenager. So this was technically off-label usage of a medication. Now, I put up the slide there just to show kind of my diversity of experience as a patient, the highs and the lows in my family and my support system. But looking at this photo, I often don't see myself represented in the research we do or understand how I fit into the research, especially as somebody who's racialized, as somebody who represents a lot of diversity, where are we in the research and where are the people I care about? So for me, it really started in my advocacy journey. It really prompted me to ask those questions early on because I wanted to see people like me or people that were in different communities than me represented in research. So I encourage you, and I think Virtue mentioned this really well about intersectionality, but adding in all those beautiful facets of intersectionality will only enhance your research. And I encourage you to know that patient partners can play a role at any point throughout the research study. And you as a, as a partner can advocate at any point for people that look like me or are like me. Thanks, Sinet. Thanks so much, Fina. And finally, I'll share uh, some of my own uh, experiences based on being part of research teams. And so I'm thinking, while the team is formulating the research question and doing the literature review, we might ask then how relevant this question is to the population we're focused on, or who are the privileged people or groups? Or is this study relevant to all of us or only to one segment of the population or a privileged group? Um, when we're doing data collection, how do we describe the people recruited as patients or as both male and female patients? And how are we looking at the diversity in the sample? It takes more work to represent the actual population that we see, so it's good to develop it's good to develop any strategies. I would hope that people would have some tried and true strategies, but I think that's uncommon. And in the data analysis, have we included gender related variables? Uh, would we get better insights using a qualitative component? 
Um, are we going to consider sex and age? And then in reviewing, I would read that mandatory section and, um, and tend to sort of skip right over it because I didn't see how I could make a difference to it. So how do you unpack the sex and gender aspect? And how do you ask questions to make sure it's not just a tick mark? So we've heard of many ways that as patient partners, we can have an impact on the sex, gender, and age considerations at different points in the research cycle. And now I'd like to hand the webinar back to Robin to talk to us briefly about a new module. What gets counted counts, paying attention to sex and age in health research. It's one of a series of modules and this one's special because the team at Women's College Hospital partnered with Virtue from Diabetes Action Canada and Maureen and me from ASU's Patient Partner Working Group to provide our feedback with the goal of making this module readily accessible to everyone who has an interest in research, including patient partners. So over to you, Robin. Thank you, Annette and Vina and Virtue. I think that when you describe from your perspectives what it means to be a patient partner and the advocacy role, the championing of sex, gender, and diverse perspectives and lenses in the research, I think we all uh, benefit. So uh, just to highlight what Annette described, she described the different ways that we can be thinking about sex and gender inclusion through the research process from the research question, what happens in the literature review? Have past studies taking a set, taken a sex and gender lens and do they report that? If not, it's a good thing to say at the end of the literature review that that is a gap. And this is at the proposal phase when um, pointing out such gaps in knowledge, it can be really critical in helping to get the proposal funded. She also talked about the data collection and data analysis and how to bring that lens into the data collection and data analysis sphere. Important also then to not um, ignore the fact when there are no sex differences. If there are no sex differences, say so. If there are no gender differences, say so. It really helps subsequent researchers know what to take forward into their own studies. And then KT and dissemination plans can be targeted for different uh, population groups. So to get to the new module that uh, Annette referenced, and yes, I am incredibly grateful to the patient partners who contribute to the final version of this, what gets counted counts, paying attention to sex and age in health research. And the reason that we decided to take this focus, uh, there are other modules in the health researchers toolkit, but the sex and age module uh, that this speaks to is about data that is almost always collected, but not always utilized. So we frequently in our demographic forms will ask about sex and we will ask about age and then do nothing relevant with that particular data that comes back to us. So that's what this module has done. It takes the focus on what we learn when we begin to disaggregate data by sex and age. It does do a little bit of consideration of gender, but uh, because we focused on gender in some of our other modules in the health reach searchers toolkit, this one is a little bit more uh, focused on sex and age specifically. So we looked at why disaggregating data by sex and age is important, problems that occur when they are not considered, and how some conditions and treatments differ by sex and age. And we have a lot of uh, reference material provided. You can see the icon on the left would lead to different reference material. This is actually an interactive e-learning module. I'm only showing you some clips from it today, but when you are in the module itself, you play through, answer questions, et cetera. We've defined the terms um, and I uh, again, thank the patient partners 
for indicating when it was important for us to be clear in our definitions of what it is that we're talking about. And we describe why the intersection of sex by age is important, and we provide examples of this. There are knowledge checks put uh, integrated throughout the module and um, resources that we have as well uh, provided some resources. I think I may have gone too far by jumping forward to this screen. So I'm actually going to stop my share and hand it back to Annette. Um, and I'll bring this one back up again later. Well, thank you very much, Robin. It's been a pleasure working with you on this webinar. And we're really, we're really grateful and happy to see the, the way that everything has worked out. Hopefully people will develop a new appetite for sex and gender and become more interested in, in hearing more about this. Um, and now we'll begin the question period. So you can raise your virtual hand and speak in person, or hopefully your questions are in the chat box. And I'm handing this over to Maureen Smith, who will be moderating the questions. Hey, thanks, Thank Annette. You. So the chat's been pretty quiet. Uh, so far, um, we we had a discussion about this and we were planning it and we said the chat would be very, very active. So please go in or but we'll start with Stuart uh, Nickel, who's got something in the chat. It's not really a question, but it would be great to hear Robin's perspective on that also. So Stuart, do you want to um, unmute yourself and and talk about this very important issue that you've raised? Sure. Uh, um, so. I mean, one of the things that sometimes, so I, I should say, I sit on research ethics boards and sometimes, you know, we get studies where we would have comments about who was included or excluded. Um, some of these are framed in terms of asking them and, and sometimes it's the response is about risk or perceived risks and sort of done on a well-intentioned perspective. Sometimes we're told, oh, we were funded to do this. So I just wondered whether I, I thought a particular avenue for, for training and support in this area would be the research ethics board, boards, but I just wonder what your thoughts were in terms of responding to some of those sorts of feedback from researchers. Hi, Stuart, thank you. Um, I think you have a really interesting question that you put forward because um, I had an experience where I was working with colleagues and we were dealing with different research ethics boards and the hospital race, uh, the hospital based research ethics board understood some of the sex and gender elements of the research study better than the university based research ethics board, which raised numerous concerns about the inclusion of patient partners and their voices in the research. This overprotective um, consideration of patient partners sometimes has a very exclusionary secondary effect. And we actually had to provide uh, considerable data um, and input from the patient partners that we had on our research team about the benefits of contributing to research and being ongoing partners, as well as being respondents to the research question. So I don't know whether I've actually answered your question or not, but um, different ethics boards come with different preconceived notions and different knowledge bases. Excuse me. I did indicate that I'm dealing with some illness. Um, I apologize. But educating the research ethics boards is really an important function. And, and um, if your research ethics boards have not invited patient partners to come and speak about the benefits of being contributing members, then I encourage you to try and get on the agenda for that purpose. That's great. Anything further on that, Stuart? No, I, again, the, other, the only other thing is in terms of the actual study participants themselves and how that's framed, in, again, in terms of sometimes paternalistic or well-intentioned protections being invoked would actually lead to exclusion. And so this, 
idea where sometimes the, the comment back is, well, it's your job not to review the science, but to review the ethics. And how do we sort of articulate that in a way that sort of works? Okay, that's great. The questions are starting to come in now. And just, so I'm gonna ask Carolyn to unmute, but just as a, oh, yes, Robin? I just wanted to respond to that part of Stuart's comment okay. about um, invoking the nothing about us without us kind of framework. Um, and that can sometimes be a useful reminder to ethics boards. Um, and I think ethics boards themselves, certainly our hospital ethics boards, um, are becoming much more mindful about the need to include patients um, and patient advisory committee members um, in the hospital research work, but also on the ethics boards itself. So continued advocacy is required. That's great. I'm going to ask uh, Carolyn to unmute in a second, but I'm going to give use my use my Q and A moderator's privilege and talk about an experience I just had recently. So sometimes in different CIHR funded projects, if you're a co-principal investigator, and many patient partners are co-principal investigators now, they ask you to actually do the CHR, CIHR module on sex, gender, uh, sex and gender uh, based analysis. So I had to do that. First of all, I had to lie to get into it. I stayed in the institution, which I don't have. I couldn't get in otherwise. I was told just lie, so I did that. Um, and then I had to do the module. And interestingly enough, I had just finished reviewing Robin's module and actually understood it for the first time and then faced the CIHR one, which was full of gobbledygook, full of acronyms. They didn't even bother to give out, you know, spell out the acronyms. So, you know, maybe there's something there too. And so that it kind of leads a little bit into Carolyn's, into what Carolyn's going to ask. But I was really, I was really kind of shocked that I was, that I was going to do this module, have to pass it, spend a really long time because I had to go over it several times. So if you're going to ask me to do something and you're not going to make it friendly to me, I think that's a, that's a big issue. And this is going to come up more and more often because uh, principal investigators, patient partners are, are, you know, on the rise now. So I see Vina nodding her head. So sorry about that, Carolyn, to preempt your question, but do you want to unmute? Yeah, thanks so much, Maureen. Um, you know, this has been a, a fabulous presentation. Uh, Annette and Robin, you've done just a, a great job at uh, really focusing from a kind of general curiosity into the critical issues, uh, especially uh, for research. And I like that uh, intersection with with ethics board reviews and uh, the importance of maybe having uh, patient panel reviews uh, or I mean it could because it's a separate it's a separate kind of function I mean that may be where we're evolving but my question is and and I come from BC and I'm aware that uh, all of our spore support units and spore uh, network members uh, are are really uh, uh, contributing in silos. We we don't know what each other <laughs> are, are up to, and we don't see our resources. And I'm wondering if if I'm ignorant about this, because Maureen, as you say, you know, as patient partners, we're, we're uh, kind of disconnected, and there are too many acronyms in our world that we don't understand. Uh, is there a, a resource, a platform for uh, learning uh, modules like this one uh, from Women's College. I'm really looking forward to exploring it. Uh, but other kinds of, of uh, learning resources that is uh, stewarded, that's maintained, that's kept up to date. Uh, because I think that there is a lot of duplication uh, and overlap in what different research entities are creating for their uh, for their networks of researchers and partners. Thanks so much. It's been great. Does anyone want to take a stab? Like I, I don't know of any, but does anyone know? But I just put it would be a great question for the National Sport Training Entity launch next week. Does anyone have an answer? Like anyone at all know if there's a if there's a place where you can find what everyone across Canada has done? Um, if I could answer, Maureen, um, I'm representing CIHR uh, fr from the SPORE team today. Uh, unfortunately, I am also very new to CIHR um, and uh, echo a lot of what you have just said, because um, I too had to take that that module um, as a re researcher, and I found it very, very 
user unfriendly. Um, having said that, uh, uh, John has um, plead me to a reply in that the sport national training entity will is going to be launched next week, actually. Um, and the intent is that it will serve as a national clearinghouse um, for all uh, such training modules that are that have been developed and are being developed by the different support units. So um, stay tuned. Uh, it is coming soon. Um, and uh, and yes, I will I will definitely take back that there is an uh, an interest in in having all these different modules and access to these different modules all in one place. Okay, thank you, Deepa. And we have a question from Dennis Newlook. Dennis, do you want to unmute and ask your question? Let's see. I don't see Dennis. Maybe he had to leave us. Okay, so we'll, oh, I see him there. Do you want me to ask your question, Dennis? Okay, I will. <laughs> okay, so he says, thank you for, to all the speakers and organizers for an engaging and informative webinar. I'm curious to know of resources slash guidelines to inform appropriate inclusive language in survey demographic questions. For example, gender identities, categories for sex, etc. Robin, do you have any uh, words of wisdom on that? I think Vina just put up her hand. <laughs> Let her go first. Oh, okay. Um, actually, no. Go ahead, Robin, because you're. We really want to utilize your expertise. <laughs> um, so language has become really well. There, Ivy is uh, answering, and she has some links even that she's going to be able to put into the chat. So I'm not going to take the time to answer completely. I what I do want to say is that a lot of this work is evolving. Um, it is not totally fixed. We do use whatever seems to be current language, but identity and identity related factors continue to evolve and sometimes seem to evolve in ever more minute um, categorizations. Um, so that when we are trying to look uh, generally across groups, it may become harder to be able to speak to representativeness of those who respond. Um, so it's just kind of, a, it is a, an area that I think where we are in flux at this point, recognizing identity and how important identity is to the way we understand and participate in research. Um, but just also I have a little um, tension around how finely we um, separate out identity related factors um, that makes it difficult to present um, conclusive guidance or findings. <clears throat> oh, That's I a can great see segue to my lot, next question. A lot <laughs> great of segue. Tools. So Mary A at 1244, do you want to unmute and ask your question? Because you just talked about tensions, Robin. This is a really good question about tensions. So Mary A. Okay, okay, I'm going to ask it. It's a really good one. So she said, um, it seems that these categories, sex, gender, ethnicity, age, etc., aka more future, more features are seen as more costly when it comes to research, because it requires more of the researcher when considering a project. I do not think all of the hesitancy is due to PI and security. Um, I don't know what PI means. <laughs> I don't know what she's talking about. Hopefully, you know. A lot of times when I ask questions, I get the response that it is costly. I want to know if this is true. Woo, that's a good one. Oh, Pat, Pat, she, PI meant personal information in her question, oh, okay. and I would have said it meant principal investigator. It's good that we, I get, <laughs> that we get clarity on some of this. Um, 
It depends whether we're looking at qualitative research and trying to use qualitative research to build an argument for a larger study that may be more quantitative in focus, trying to reach ever larger groups in order to determine um, how, how common an issue itself might be. I myself am a qualitative researcher and I think the individual and the individual story is radically important um, and that sometimes those individual stories get subsumed under the collective. Um, I'm going to cough so I'm going to mute for a second. But um, a lot of what needs to take place in convincing people comes from numbers, not just qualitative research. So we are always as researchers playing with that tension between what is important to understand about individuals and their experience, and then how can we tell a story about a collective that has some impact and will make some differences in the way that funding gets allocated or healthcare delivered. Um, so uh, I would just say that as a qualitative researcher, I am interested in the individual story and I try to highlight that. Um, and often there are collective elements across individual stories and that those two can come out through the qualitative research and then somehow feed into larger investigations. And in hey, we're gonna take answer. a last question from Sandra. Sorry, sorry, Robin. I, mean, I, I have to look at the screen instead of just talking. That's my problem, looking away. Okay. So Sandra wow. Holdsworth's got the last question and I will try to take a, a, a not too long of an answer so that we can, we can wrap up. So go ahead, Sandra. <laughs> Uh, no pressure. So Robin, in regards about what you're talking about gender and, and uh, research. So when a survey's done, when it's done online and all the different options are there, I think it's good. But the, um, the, some of the research I've done when they're done by telephone, my feedback was to the people that were doing the research that they can just ask the question like, how do you identify yourself? instead of listing all of those, because those who aren't as well educated as us might be thrown off by all those, but other people who know what their gender is and they know how to identify themselves will say it, and then you already have that box there, and then you will be able to get the data that you are, but it makes it, um, you know, it makes it comfortable for um, you know, the people that you're asking the question of. And also too, like when even surveys, when you read everything out, I think, you know, people will know like what their race is and what their gender is. So thanks for a great presentation. So thanks that was so just much, advice Sandra. to researchers. Thanks, Sandra. I'm going to hand it back to Annette for the, uh, for, for the final minutes, because we're definitely going to end on time. So everybody can Ooh. get back to their, their, their lives and their and their jobs and everything they have to do today. Go ahead, Annette. Thanks, Maureen. So no ad libs. <laughs> Thank you so much to our presenters, Vina Virtue and Robin, and our question and answer moderator, Maureen Smith, and John Riley, who's running things behind the scenes. Um, but most of all, thank you to everybody who joined us today. The slides from today's webinar and the recording will be available on the ASU news and Twitter feeds. That's the Ontario Sports Support Unit. And as always, we'd like to know what we can do to improve these webinars. So please take a minute to fill out the webinar experience survey. The link is in the chat and I hope everybody has an enjoyable weekend. Thank you.